welcome along to The Pastor's Heart. It's great to have you with us. Dominic Steele is my name. I've just been away for the last couple of days up in country New South Wales and uh, it's been really good to talk to different Christian ministry leaders there about um, how they've benefited from uh, being involved in watching and interacting with what we're doing here on The Pastor's Heart. Of course, we're on Facebook each week uh, and our website, thepastorsheart.net. Uh, lots of people tuning in through the podcast, through the catch-up audio. Uh, we're getting tremendous encouragement from those people over in Clayton, Clayton TV in the UK who are watching us, uh, watching us there. And pretty recently, we've been joined by the uh, Anglican Cable Network from uh, Nigeria and broadcasting right across uh, Africa and uh, really into half of Europe. And we're attempting to serve Christian leaders all over the place. Uh, today, my guest is Craig Hamilton. He's the author of this excellent book, Wisdom and Leadership, uh, The How and Why of Leading the People You Serve. It's available from MatthiasMedia.com. Uh, this copy is, well, <laughs> it, I just picked it up from the desk of one of my staff members upstairs. Um, my copy is far more dog-eared, far more scribbled all over, because it is such a helpful book. And if you haven't got a copy, if your team hasn't got a hopper copy, you want to get one of those for them. Now, Craig, welcome along. It's great to have you. Dominic, thank you. Now, uh, the default is to talk to you about leadership skills, um, but I want to start actually with the heart of the pastor. Um, and because um, you're saying that's actually the most important thing rather than the skill. Right, yes, yeah. that's right. And. What are the big problems? Pride? Fear? Yes, both of those. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the issue is often we, when it comes to leadership and leadership skills, we think the main problem that we have is we don't know the skills. But really, even after you've learnt the skills, often it's the heart that's still going to get you into mm -hmm. trouble. Mm -hmm. In particular, I think pride and fear. Mm -hmm. So how do people come a cropper there? of their pride, of their fear. Mm. Well, I mean, I think it comes out in lots of different ways. I think that's the thing. Pride and fear are both sneaky sins and they'll find their way out in lots of different avenues, lots mm -hmm. of different ways, which is why I think leading ourself is the most important person we need to think about when it comes to our leadership. Okay, so I'm leading myself. What do, what do I need to be careful on there? Well, there's so many. You. you you need to think about not just all the things that you're doing, because all the things that you do are all going to be filtered through who you are. Mm -hmm. Every time you lead anyone, it's all going to come out of you, which means that those things about you, those areas in your life where your maybe leadership's not on point mm -hmm. about you, it's going to impact everyone else. So what if I, I do want to do the analysis? What, what, what kind of thing would you recommend I do? Yeah, to kind of, to do the pulse check to, yeah. There's a chapter in the book, mm -hmm. a great book by a local author. Yeah. Um, I'll wait for it here again, on, <laughs> and There's a chapter in there on self-leadership. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, I have 14 self-leadership questions that I ask myself. Okay, we'll put them up on the screen. If you're listening on the podcast, we'll, we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, keep going, these 14 points. Yes, I ask these of myself relatively regularly, maybe every three to four months or so. I'll sit down and I'll just think through these questions and just check where things are up to. So I did it on the plane this afternoon. Uh, looking through, I mean, is my character submitted to Christ? Is my commitment solid? Is my vision clear? Is my passion hot? Is my pride subdued? Um, are my fears in their place? Is my own personal baggage in check? Is my pace sustainable? Is my zeal to serve developing? Is my heart for God increasing? Is my capacity for loving people deepening? Am I playing to my strengths? Am I still learning? Does my family recognize me? It all felt a little bit too painful and close to home to me. It's a lot of questions, isn't it? It's a lot of questions. And some of them are very hard. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, but they're so important. If you get these things wrong, then lots of other things down the line will get impacted as well. Mm -hmm. What about is my pride subdued? That seemed to be the one you zeroed in on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think the reason why I like to put that one as its own is because pride is just such a sneaky sin that it needs it in my life 
it needs its own special focus because I can easily ignore it or scooch around it when in fact it's, it's my main issue. So I reckon you might have had a special temptation on this. I mean, here you are, the guy who's written the leadership book, you know, and people come and say, this is a great, I mean, I've just come and said, this is a great book, been super helpful. Yeah. And what does that do? Does, how does that mess with your head, do you know? When yeah. It happens again and again and again. What, what do you do to, to work on that? One of the main things that I do is whenever I talk to anyone about leadership or when I speak somewhere, I always make sure I'm very deliberate and very detailed in describing all of the things that we're doing wrong in my ministry today. Mm -hmm. Because, like, just because I wrote the book doesn't mean that it's all going 100% well and mm -hmm. there are mistakes that I still make and I'm still learning and I make sure that's front and center. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, you talked about four concrete areas that we need to, to think about. Yeah. yeah. Yep. When it comes to pride and fear, I think the mm. first one is how that impacts culture. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the second one is when it comes to leading ourselves. We've already talked mm -hmm. about that, leading the hardest person. Mm -hmm. The third one is when it comes to ministry distribution, handing over ministry mm -hmm. to others. And then lastly, it's then the decision-making clarity that's needed for when we hand over. So let's do culture. Sure. Yeah. What's, the, what's, your, what's your issue there? Well, I think in one sense... It's cul the culture of the church, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're thinking church culture. We're thinking any organization has a culture, families, mm -hmm. schools, businesses, churches. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's the bit that's hard to quantify, hard to define. When I say culture, what I mean is the attitudes, values, um, unwritten rules, behaviors that then manifest in the church. Mm -hmm. Just It's just how we do things around here. Mm -hmm. That's culture. Mm -hmm. But the way that that kind of gets, the, the reason why that's so important is because we have processes in our churches and we have culture. Processes are things like preaching, um, small groups, finances, baptisms, weddings, funerals, hospital visits. Organizational stuff. Yeah, yeah. the things that we do. And then you have culture, which is more how we do the things that we do. Mm -hmm. And so everything that we do comes out of and is impacted by the culture of our church, just mm -hmm. how it works around here. Now, the issue is you can have smart processes or you can have stupid processes. You can have healthy cultures or you can have toxic, unhealthy Cultures. So in a church, what's a toxic culture as opposed to a healthy culture? Well, a healthy culture might be something like there is uh, freedom to do things. There is candor and truthfulness when we speak to each other. There is um, low politics, low backstabbing, those kind of things. That would be a, that would be a healthy church culture. A toxic church culture would be then the opposite. It would be low levels of trust, high levels of politicking. Um, it, it would be um, um, people not wanting to stay around, people not knowing whether someone's telling me the truth or not. All those kind of things lead to a toxic culture. Mm -hmm. Healthy? Yeah, and so healthy is the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Healthy is the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's Good, highly appreciative, good morale, highly appreciative. High morale, yeah. lots of trust, uh, truthfulness. So I want to work at that church, not the other one. Right. How do I get there? <laughs> well, again, it starts with the leader. It mm -hmm. starts with the self because in one sense, it's the leader who's going to set the culture for their ministry, for their church. It starts with me. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I sense that my church might have some toxic cultural elements, the first place I need to look is to do that hard, difficult questioning of, is it in me? Mm -hmm. And if it is, then I need, to, I need to start the work here. Before we start to think about anyone else or how we do things, it's got to start with me. Now, without naming names, I, I mean, what you've just said to me, you've said in a different number of places. I presume you've had some conversations with people who've said, you know, as I went and reflected, 
I think you were right. I think I've got to change this area of my character. And I'm hoping that that will then trickle down into the church. Um, yeah. Give us any, a couple of examples. Well, I mean, I think there's so many. I mean, I think, I think this is a lot of churches because, not because a lot of churches are bad, but because a lot of people are normal. Mm -hmm. A lot of leaders are normal. And we've all got our issues and pride is going to be at play in every mm -hmm. one of us, you, me, mm -hmm. all of us. And so, you know, there was one church where there was high levels of politics in the sense of we came to the meeting, no one said what they really thought. We just all agreed and said whatever had to be said for the meeting to happen. And then we all left. And then we had the meeting after the meeting mm -hmm. where we were in the car park, in the hallway, and we said what we really should thought. have said <laughs> in, in the meeting. The meeting. Yeah. But we said it in the hallways and in the car parks. And that kind of thing is a just, that, 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 that's a toxic, destructive kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there's one church like that. Um, and I think that would be a lot of churches. That'd mm. be a lot of meetings. Mm. Um, another one was a place where, I mean, I guess it's a, 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 a similar kind of thing where there wasn't, you couldn't speak the truth. People were more afraid of the response from the boss than they were about dealing with the actual problem that was happening in their church. They were, they were more afraid of him than they were afraid of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. So how do you run a staff meeting that works to create that kind of... How do you, how do you be the leader that, that has the staff meeting, that has that kind of culture? <laughs> right. This is, it, this is hard. It's really hard. Yeah. It takes humility. Yeah. It takes maybe a bit of vulnerability from the leader. It takes um, being able to say to the team, mm, perhaps I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. All those things are hard. And the reason why they're so hard is because pride. Mm. And there's, there'll be other things too. You know, you need to say, you need to be able to create this space where we can speak the truth and and no one gets in trouble for saying what they really think. And that's very hard. Because sometimes you do it by accident. Mm. You punish people for saying what they think, not intentionally, but just unthinkingly. Mm. It's very hard. What's an idea? I'm just thinking about the size of the team. Um, uh, as I think about our staff team, we've We've oscillated in size mm. over the year. I mean, we oscillate in size even during the year, depending on who's away and who's not there. But when everyone's there and all the student ministers as well, there's 14 or 16 of them. Yeah. And um, and actually, it's very hard to be vulnerable in front of 16, to be really vulnerable in right. front of 16 people. Yeah. Whereas much easier to be vulnerable in front of four or five people. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes it's not though. Sometimes it's the opposite. It's easier to be vulnerable in front of more of a crowd. Yes, I can, I can be vulnerable preaching. <laughs> right, right, than it is to be like us. But I think one of the keys to the vulnerability puzzle is being able to say things like, you're better at that than I am. Mm -hmm. Can you show me how you do that? Um, I, like, like I, I need your help. Right. Those, that kind of vulnerability, without, and if I say that to you, I know that you won't think I'm not as good or that you are, there's no sense that I might be kicked out of this team just because you're better at something than I am. Right. If we can have that kind of trust, then our team is on the way mm -hmm. to having a healthy culture. Other hints? I mean, uh, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, another one would be um, in the staff meeting, just to make sure that you kill the meeting after the meeting and that you kill the meeting before the meeting. We don't need to meet before the meeting to work out what we'll say in the meeting. In the meeting, we'll just say what we think. And then we need to make sure that after the meeting, there's no meetings about what they said or what they chose, what they did, because they is us. And so as the leader, being able to maybe even say to the team, you know, I don't want to have meetings after the meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to say what you think when we're here. Otherwise, what's the point of doing this? Mm. That'd be another tip. Yeah. You've written a line, culture change 
is modeling plus consistency plus normalizing plus communication plus time. Mm. Give me that. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Changing a culture is very hard, very complicated. It's, you know, it's like the, the processes are often easier. I'll just do the preaching and do the hospital visit and work on the financial system because I get that. The culture stuff, it's soft, it's, it's not objective, I'm not really very familiar with it, but it's, it's just very hard. So to change the culture, it's trying to simplify a very complicated thing that it starts with me, that's the uh, modeling, mm -hmm. it needs to be consistent can't be modeling inconsistently yeah so I need to be it needs to become how I am and then it needs to be normalized in our church in mm -hmm. our group we need to be how this is this is how we do it does it mean you can't have vigorous debates oh it means that you should have vigorous debates mm -hmm. so that would be a good sign of a healthy culture that we can all say what we think disagree with each other but still be friends still respect each other still be on the same page, on the same team. Having robust conversations is a sign of a healthy culture. Cool, okay. Keep going, I, I, I interrupted you. Normalizing <laughs> communication. You yeah. need to be able to say, this is, what, this is now what it's like around here. Uh -huh. And then time, it just takes time. time. Mm -hmm. um, what's a shadow impulse? Yes, the shadow impulse, first thing you need to know what the impulse is. Yeah. The impulse is uh, most of us get into ministry leadership because we love people and we love the ministry. We love seeing people grown and loved and converted and helped and cared for through teaching and ministry. That's, that's the ministry impulse. Mm -hmm. The shadow impulse is when I want and love to see people loved, cared for, converted, helped through teaching and ministry done by me. And it's just those last little bits done by me, that's the shadow impulse. It looks from the outside almost the same as a normal healthy ministry impulse. I want to see people helped and loved and converted and cared for and ministered to. But when it becomes by me, then it's, it's, it's a destructive impulse because what I'm wanting is it's only I, it's only me who can do the ministry. It's only me who can do the preaching, the converting, the conversations, the pastoral caring. It has to be done by me, which then constricts. The we can only grow so big. We yeah. can only grow so big. There's only so much of me. There's only so much of what I can do, but it's so sneaky because it looks and feels just like a regular healthy ministry impulse except done by me and i look around and i think i think lots of my peers and lots of my elders have massively struggled with that yeah you know? yeah this is again i think it's in one sense it's normal i think it's in all of us i, I think the seed of the shadow impulse is in all of us it's in you it's in me but the question's not, you know, is it in me? Because the answer is, it is. Yeah. The question is, am I feeding it? Am I watering it? That's, that's the question. So how do I distribute ministry then? Yes. Well, I think there's, there's lots of reasons why we do and why we, we want to because we can do more, the kingdom, there's more work to be done, more people helped. Yeah. But some of the reasons why we don't is because A, what if the person that I distribute this ministry to is not as good at it as I am? That's the high likelihood that they won't yep. be because I'm the professional. I've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So maybe if they're not going to do it as well as me, maybe I just won't hand it over. Yep. Number two, but then what if they're better than me? What if the first time I ask you to do something on your first try, you're better than I am? Mm. And then what does that say about me? And why are they paying me? So that's number two, maybe we don't distribute because what if they're gonna do a better job? Mm -hmm. Number three is there are some things I just like doing. Yep. Number four is, um, well, it takes a long time to, to distribute because yep. it's hard. It's harder, yep. 
So what, what we need to do is when we distribute in ministry, make sure we distribute the responsibility and also the authority. And both of those things have to be handed over, responsibility and the authority. Okay. If you just hand over the responsibility... Now, I think you're, to, you're, you're taking us into a quadrilateral, aren't you? At this, take, point? This, is a, this is the ministry distrib distribution quadrilateral. So those of you listening to us on the audio podcast, if you are watching us, well, we're about to put a, an image of the ministry quadrilateral up on the screen. <laughs> but we're going to try and talk it through um, as we do it. On the uh, on the screen here. So tell us about the tell us about the quadrilateral, Craig. Okay. So if if we hand over no authority and no responsibility, then we're not building leaders. We're going to build followers. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. But if we go and we distribute authority but no responsibility, what we're going to be creating is a tyrant, someone who has all the authority, but no responsibility. Yeah, that's not a leader. Alternatively, we could hand over the responsibility, but not hand over the authority. This one's much more common. But it, like when we do that, we're still not building leaders. We're building, I think, a scapegoat, someone who's really responsible, but with no authority. But if we want to build leaders, we need to hand over the authority and the responsibility, because that's what it means to be a leader. Okay. Um, well, they're either going to do it really well or they're not going to do it really well. Yeah. What if I get it right? What if I give the responsibility and I give the authority and they muck it up? Yes, which is highly likely. <laughs> okay, so help me. <laughs> yeah. Because so, that's why I'm frightened of doing it. Well, that's right. That's right. That's why it's so hard. So it, it could be that um, there's an issue with me. It could be that I didn't brief them properly. I didn't brief them properly. I didn't help them. I didn't explain what I was wanting. It could be that. Yeah. I, I mean, and I'm to tempted check. to give them the authority and the responsibility and then check in every day. Yes. Yes. Which may be helpful. It may not be helpful. It depends <laughs> on who this person is. So, so you're not saying to me, give them the, the responsibility and authority and then don't check. Yes. D don't and then just give it and then walk away. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. So you, we, we don't want to do that. But we also, so it, it could be I didn't hand it over well. That's highly likely. I should check myself. Mm -hmm. But what if I did and they just didn't do a good job, but it was fine. It just wasn't great. Yeah. Which is actually probably the situation in many ministries where both staff and volunteers have been asked to do different tasks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably, it's probably okay, but not the yeah. best. Not and, as good as I could do. And Well, I'm not going to take us to the next level. Not yeah. really. I mean, we, part of the reason of delegating it is so that we will grow. Yeah. <laughs> so that I'm not doing the, I've got to do it all. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it, so it could be that um, I need to trust the person to fix their mistake. Because that, that's important. That's how I trust me. When I give myself things that I need to do, I don't trust me to never make a mistake. I trust me to fix my mistakes when I make them. Yeah. So it could be that. But it might be that I need to be a bit more nuanced in how I hand over the responsibility and the authority. It doesn't have to be black or white, on or off. You have it all or you have none. We can grade that over time, uh -huh. which is another decision-making clarity idea. Yep. Is this a uh, quadrilateral that we have? Uh, we don't, but tell me about it. Yeah. Okay. So we, we need to think when we're handing things over, this is what I do with my teams. We'll sit down and we'll literally write out the decision-making authority that they have into four quadrants or four areas. Yep. The first one is here are the things that you can just do. Yep. Don't even talk to me about it. You can if you want to, but just go and do these things. Yep. They're yours. The second category are things that you can just go and do and you need to report to me about them regularly. Yep. Whatever that is, once a week, once a month, once a term, whatever we think yep. regularly. 
The third category is here are the things that you can just do, but you need to report to me immediately. Uh -huh. Send me a text, send me a Facebook message straight away, but just do it. And then the fourth category are here are the things that I didn't want you to think about until we talk first. Okay. All right. So give me a ministry area and give me a couple of decisions under those. Yep. Those, so those things, let's, tasks think, under those let's things. Let's think youth ministry. Okay. So the things that you might be able to just do is you can um, um, turn up, unlock the door, put things out, talk to your leaders, tell the leaders what time mm -hmm. we're going to come, communicate, just do that. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Maybe the things that you would do and report regularly about are, um, you know, is if there's some um, leadership training yep. that we're going to do, that you're going to do, yep. great, do that and just report to me regularly how it went. Um, maybe report to me immediately if there's a high schooler who breaks their leg on a Friday night Fix it. Don't you have to call me? Call the ambulance. Do what yep. you need to do. But then send me a text immediately because yep. on Sunday someone's mum is going to have a conversation with me, yep. and I need to know. Yeah, or perhaps before. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps before. <laughs> and then um, things that we might need to think about. If you want to change anything to do with our strategy, what we're trying to do. I thought you were going to say if you want to have a bonfire on Friday <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. If we want to have a bonfire in the church auditorium. Let's talk about that first. Okay, <laughs> right. And so then what, what then that then helps the leader to do is they now have clarity on what they can do and what they can't. And it means that they have more confidence to then do those things without doing the wrong thing. And you reckon kind of every role that I give somebody a responsibility and authority for, there's going to be areas in those four categories it, um, kind of linked to. Yeah. It's worth having... That four, you would have that four category discussion yep. as part of the kind of assigning someone to a role. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Unless the role is very simple. Right. But let, 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 help me with welcoming team. Come yeah. On. Just. Um, yep. So that's, as in like someone who's at the door handing out the flyers, saying hi well, to people. Well, we've given them the vision of we want people to feel welcomed. Yeah. You know, and so. Um, well, actually, I'm thinking moving the coffee machine might be talk to me about it first. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, uh, handing out the flyers. I mean, Father's Day. I mean, we Mother's Day. We decide to give people presents at the door or something like that. You probably put that in one of the middle ones, the two or three. You yep. Know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that's right. And this is the thing. This these four categories. This is a dynamic but actually thing. thinking about the process of where the limits of your authority and response that's really what you're doing you're right. thinking about the process of where the limits of authority and responsibility for uh, that's fall right. so that the so, I mean the person who's organizing advertising you can you can choose the posters but I want to see them first Do you right know? right yeah, you can yep. you can um, uh, come to me before you spend money. Do you know? Yes, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah good. I'm, I'm there now. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why is because people want to do a good Job. job, basically, yeah. most people. There's probably one or two who want to do a bad job, but generally speaking, people want to do a good job. Yeah. And so then you just want to help them to know that they're doing a good job because you want them to make decisions and be confident and do the, do the tasks. Great. Craig, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Pleasure. My guest this afternoon has been Craig Hamilton. He's on the team at Glenmore Park Anglican Church. He's the author of Wisdom in Leadership and uh, the How and Why of Leading the People You Serve. Uh, great book available from MatthiasMedia.com. Thanks for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you next week on The Pastor's Heart. Mm -hmm.